optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I answer your personal question? Now we're just seeing a perfect time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. This episode is brought to you by FreshBooks. Thousands of listeners and a lot of the contractors I use and my readers use FreshBooks. If you've been thinking about turning your part-time side business into a full-time small business, or big business for that matter, you may be feeling some extra uncertainty these days, and uh, that's obviously completely natural. There are a lot of questions that can come up. How do you create a professional appearance and experience? Who can help you with support? How do you manage the billing and all of that, but still focus on the primary work of your business and on growing your business? FreshBooks is an all-in-one invoicing and accounting solution, it does a lot more than that, that helps you take your business from part-time to full-time and it only takes minutes to set up. They have one of the best sign-up flows in the business. I've seen very few better. They have been helping people turn their passions into small businesses for 15 years and they can help you too. I've met the founders. I've looked at this product very closely. With automated invoicing, billable time, and expense tracking, and an intuitive dashboard that ties it all together, it's like having a full-time financial assistant with you every step of the way. You can create, customize, and send branded and professional looking invoices in about 30 seconds. You get paid up to twice as fast with fees as low as 1% using ACH payments on FreshBooks. It's a fast, easy, and secure way for clients to pay you for your work and pay you more quickly. One of the many things that sets FreshBooks apart is their award-winning Toronto-based customer service. A real person picks up fast and will help you until you are completely satisfied and have your questions answered. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now, but your ability to build a business that you're passionate about, that you're proud of, doesn't have to be one of those things. Business owners all over the world rate FreshBooks as the easiest accounting software to use. Try it out. Check it out for free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash Tim. Just enter Tim Ferriss in the how did you hear about us section. Again, that's freshbooks.com slash Tim to check it out and try it for free for 30 days. One more time, freshbooks.com slash Tim. This episode is brought to you by Five Bullet Friday, my very own email newsletter. It's become one of the most popular email newsletters in the world with millions of subscribers, and it's super, super simple. It does not clog up your inbox. Every Friday, I send out five bullet points, super short, of the coolest things I've found that week, which sometimes includes apps, books, documentaries, supplements, gadgets, new self-experiments, hacks, tricks, and all sorts of weird stuff that I dig up from around the world. You guys, podcast listeners and book readers, have asked me for something short and action-packed for a very long time, because after all, the podcast, the books, they can be quite long. And that's why I created Five Bullet Friday. It's become one of my favorite things I do every week. It's free, it's always going to be free, and you can learn more at tim.blog forward slash Friday. That's tim.blog forward slash Friday. I get asked a lot how I meet guests for the podcast, some of the most amazing people I've ever interacted with. And little known fact, I've met probably 25% of them because they first subscribed to Five Bullet Friday. So you'll be in good company. It's a lot of fun. Five Bullet Friday is only available if you subscribe via email. I do not publish the content on the blog or anywhere else. Also, if I'm doing small in-person meetups, offering early access to startups, beta testing, special deals, or anything else that's very limited, I share it first with Five Bullet Friday subscribers. So check it out, tim.blog forward slash Friday. If you listen to this podcast, it's very likely that you'd dig it a lot. And you can, of course, easily subscribe any time. So easy peasy. Again, that's tim.blog forward slash Friday. And thanks for checking it out. If the spirit moves you. Hello, boys and girls. This is Tim Ferriss. Welcome to perhaps the most impromptu tap dancing version of the Tim Ferriss show that you will hear. I have with me my friend Sam Harris. I always enjoy speaking with Sam. We had originally planned to do a session at South by Southwest. That has been canceled. And we have been put into circumstances that may require or encourage different topics. The plan had been meditation, psychedelics, and dangerous ideas. I said to Sam before we hit record that I can probably use a fair dose of at least the first two in my life right now. But 
Sam, we were deliberating what to talk about, and I'll, I'll tell you an embarrassing fact, a secret of sorts. I have a deck of cards that I thought could be a lifeline if need be called Three Things, which has prompts of different questions that I could ask you that I've wanted to ask right. you anyway. But how should we even frame this conversation? Well, first, let me say that at this point, I'm committed to producing the worst episode of the Tim Ferriss podcast <laughs> ever aired. So let's, let's, let's start there. I appreciate uh, your heart, your hardworking Protestant <laughs> ethic. Um, well, I mean, what, what's amazing, I mean, as, as you know, I also have a podcast, and um, I'm finding, I'm obviously speaking a lot about uh, the coronavirus and our our inept response to it and all of the all the attendant concerns, but there's just this bewildering experience of having one's core interests sidelined and even just seeming patently inappropriate to air. I mean, I've, I have podcasts on several topics that I just can't drop in the current environment. Actually, not because they're they're too frivolous and and tone deaf in that way, but because they're they're on yet other emergencies uh, or or grim topics that that I can't imagine anyone wants to pay attention to now, like you know nuclear war or the prospect of, of nuclear war and nuclear terrorism. I mean, who the hell wants to think about that right now? And uh, so yeah, it, and to say nothing of things like you know psychedelics. I mean, who <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, <laughs> this does not seem like a moment to. Uh, do a whopping dose of mushrooms or anything else uh, with uh, <laughs> with an invading virus uh, looming in every corner of the world. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, talk about set and setting. It's it's the wrong both. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I feel like we should just have a conversation. And uh, although, I, I although I'll remind you, you. <laughs> I should I should remind you of your tweet about um, who was it? Some I don't think you named the person, but someone in your circle said. You know, we should now we should drop. You know, we should take oh, ayahuasca. No, or something I know and, what it is. And talk said, to the pangolin. He said, "I think it's time to you know, take some peyote and talk to the pangolin." Right. right. <laughs> so, so that that elicited a trollish tweet from me. I don't know if you saw <laughs> that come across your radar. Wait, I, th I think it might have. What was your response? Uh, I said, uh, "Just spoke to the pangolin. Unfortunately, he's working for the bat, and the bat's an asshole." <laughs> and, and that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, it is a tricky time to track down spirit animals in the psychedelic astral yeah. plane, for sure. <laughs> you have to do contact tracing. Right. That's right. Uh, so I have these cards surrounding me. I am also committed to to making the, the worst episode of the Tim Ferriss show since its inception, uh, which would match a lot of things that are hitting their worst since inception moments. But let me just throw a few out there or one to begin with and we'll see where that goes and you can completely veto and we can take it in a different direction sure what are three things you have learned about fear that is the question on the card um in general or in or based on recent events in general in your life yeah, or we current events any way you want to take it yeah, um, a couple things. One is that it is certainly necessary. You wouldn't want to be without it. You wouldn't want to have your amygdala removed and, and simply be insensitive to kind of the fear-based initial response to stimuli or, or even ideas, right? So it's, it's a necessary part of the toolkit for obvious evolutionary reasons and as well as personal ones. Uh, and, and, and many people imagine that if you get deep into meditation or you know, some other spiritual practice, the goal is to get rid of fear and, and other classically negative states of mind entirely. And that's really not the way I view it. So uh, you, you wouldn't want to never feel it again, but you want to be able to stop feeling it whenever it's no longer useful. And it, it really is only useful for a very short period of time. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, a, a signal... Uh, of of salience more than anything else. I mean, it's it's negatively valenced salience. But what do you mean uh, by that? Um, actually, I, I should say that the, it's it's often thought that the amygdala really is just the kind of the fear center and, and doesn't do much of anything else. It, it's not just that. It really is more the the salience centers. It's it's, it's when you're uh, noticing information that 
really needs to be emotionally and behaviorally relevant you know, in the moment. So um, your, your response to scary faces, you know, that would be a classic stimuli. You know, you, you turn the corner and you, and you see somebody staring at you and they look terrifying. You know, that instantaneous visceral uh, perception of threat you, you don't want to lose that, right? I can't imagine, you know, being a social primate, you know, however much I meditate, uh, wanting to completely lose that. But what you, you you want to then be able to do is let go of it the moment uh, you're no longer served by seeing the world through that lens. And for so much of our fear that, that uh, you know, then grades into ordinary anxiety, it's just not useful. You know, it's just, it's not useful to have stress of that sort become the the mood music of your life and and which is what happens to so many of us and it's, it's happening to you know, millions and millions of us in this moment around this pandemic so i mean the first thing i guess i guess there are two things there the, the first thing is that you, you you still want this this is not this is a gift this is not a curse but it becomes a curse the moment you can't actually let go of it you know, more or less on demand, and and you want to be able to do that. I mean, so that's certainly two things. And the third thing, I guess, the third thing I would add is that you actually can do that. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, mindfulness is the the method by which you would do that. And um, so, the, you know, there, there's a path to being able to do that more and more and and more and more quickly. Can you think of a moment for you or a situation in which you were experiencing? acute anxiety or fear and used mindfulness as an intervention? Could you describe it, if so? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, no, it happens a lot. It's happening a lot in this circumstance. I guess um, I mean, the one I remember very clearly was sort of the, the beginning of my taking the, uh, the COVID problem seriously. And I forget when this was. This is the end of February at some point, um, so somewhere in like February 25th or so. And um, I had ordered an iPad uh, some weeks before when I was when I was truly oblivious to what was going on. And you know, it, fi- it finally came. And I, uh, I mean, again, at this point, I'm thinking thoughts like, "Wait a minute, how long does the virus live on a surface?" I see that this thing is, you know, freshly minted in Shanghai and sent to me, you know, after they've clamped down on the the uh, Wuhan problem. Um, I, you know, I don't so I don't know what the the likelihood is that I'm not now opening a box of virus, but you know, I, I've decided to open it uh, after letting it sit for some days. So I'm opening this box, and I, I realize that I'm kind of double-minded about it and in some ways just kind of in bad faith with the whole project. So like on the one hand, I'm taking precautions, right? I'm, I'm, I'm wearing, you know, I'm wearing gloves, but I'm not wearing a, a mask. I'm opening it carefully. I've got, you know, I've, I've decided to just wipe this iPad down with alcohol wipes. So on some level, I'm treating it like medical waste. But on another level, I recognize, wait a minute, I'm not doing this even remotely the way I would do it if I knew there was coronavirus in this box, right? And so on some level, I'm kind of going through the motions and I'm assuming that this is fine and that I'm actually being crazy. And this is kind of a pantomime of preparedness as opposed to the real thing. And it is the experience of kind of almost being double-minded. Like, you know, like the person who's opening the box is not the whole person. And there's there's another part of me looking on saying, uh, you're not really doing this correctly. And as witnessed by the fact that I'm standing in the middle of my living room and my kids are like, you know, 15 feet away. And there's just no, like I just, I, in a flash, I, I recognized, okay, you, you, you're doing all of this. You've got the alcohol wipes, you've got the gloves on. You're acting like someone who thinks he's overreacting, right? You're kind of, you're just, again, in, in, in bad faith. You're not, you're not actually unified uh, as just a behavioral system. And at that moment, I just got kind of flooded with anxiety over this whole, uh, kind of the, the, the scope of the whole crisis, like how difficult it, it had been for me to convince myself that the problem was worth responding to, 
all the people I'm in dialogue with, you know, in my family personally and, and in my social circle, and then just in the public, you know, the kind of public conversation that was, was starting around it. And I just realized how difficult it was going to be to change my own behavior and for everyone else around us to change our behavior in a way that was actually going to be effective. And But at that moment, it just, like, it was a very punctate experience of it just, like, you know, just cortisol, which is like, oh, fuck, you know, you were, you, you, but you do not have your shit together at all, right? You're in the middle of your living room opening a box of virus. You you sort of think so. Um, and you've – but you haven't done – you know, it's like – again, my kids are like 15 feet away from me at this point. And uh, so I, I just felt like a complete fuck up. Uh, and – but it, it was at that moment where I thought, okay, I am actually still pretty early. Uh, you know, the I, I took, you know, a, a kind of – uh, you know, I don't know how to quantify the risk, but like, okay, wake up and actually get your game together here. And at, at that moment, you know, from that moment onward, the the anxiety is no longer useful, right? Like the, the to, to be stressed out. I mean, once I've right, the message has been delivered. Yeah, it's it's, it's a hundred percent delivered, and the o- the only time it's useful as any kind of holding pattern for me is when there's still significant uncertainty about what to do. So when you're at the border between what you know you're doing and what you, you know, don't understand and and you're trying to figure out what you should do, you can't figure out what your policy is, then anxiety is the thing that's going to get you to keep focusing and, and figure it out. But once you figure it out, once you realize, okay, and you open the boxes outside, you wear gloves, you, you know, let them sit for however many days you decide to let, let them sit, you wipe things down that can be wiped down, there, there's no reason to be adrenalized at all doing any of that stuff as long as you know what you're doing right yeah. and and so that's and and again mindfulness is really the method by which you can let go of it because you 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 notice the thoughts you notice this peripheral physiology of of you know just the the, the felt sense of being anxious and you notice the connection between those things and once you once you just let the thoughts go and just become willing to just feel the raw sensations of anxiety, the sensations lose their their psychological import. I mean, it's just, again, it just feels like, you know, indigestion or itching or, a, you know, or a pain in the knee or anything else that has no real meaning. It's just it's just sensation. And it degrades over a half-life of, of really seconds. I mean, it, it does not stay around long. So anyway, that's, I mean, that's the experience uh, I remember. And, you know, obviously there have been many like that. But um, uh, you know, it's useful for a few seconds, it, and it's necessary for a few seconds. But then, beyond that, you're just resurrecting it by what you're doing with your mind in the next moment. I find your app, and I've said this to you before, waking up app, very useful for training for this. And in a number of the meditations, which are at least in the introductory course sequenced in a a logical progression, a sort of building progression, much like you might hope to learn a language starting with the basic building blocks and working your way up. There's a there's a phrase that you use in a number of them with the snap of fingers, which is Mm. just drop it. Right. And not not viewing that as a hill to climb, not viewing that as something that requires a tremendous amount of conscious effort, but something that can happen in an instant. When you're opening this box, I'm glad you said iPad. I was wondering if it was just a box of bats or something. Right. Uh, <laughs> might, might as well have been. <laughs> Got to cook those at a minimum of 400 degrees. Right. And then is there something you say to yourself in that moment to try to defuse the no longer useful anxiety is there anything that you point your attention towards or is it just a reflexive act of of mindfulness much like someone like jocko can reassemble god knows how many weapons in the dark <laughs> with the yeah, right, right. <laughs> being woken up uh you know a half hour early so at 4 a.m uh yeah how long does it take to clean and reassemble the gun of mindfulness uh, right yeah well, you know, so i mean there's there are reflections and and concepts you know, you know pieces of language that can be useful I, I don't at this point tend to carry many of those around i mean i might spontaneously think something that is useful i mean you know, a bit of self talk but 
generally speaking, it really is just watching the present thought kind of unravel. I mean, the moment I notice I'm thinking without noticing a thought itself as an appearance in consciousness, the moment I notice I'm identified with, in this case, an anxious thought, um, <clears throat> then I just I can see the, the, the thought itself unwind in this larger condition, which is just, you know, open awareness. And so I, it is a kind of non-conceptual, you know, immediate pivot to that, or or it's just a, you know, kind of recognizing the circumstance, you know, from that point of view that happens, you know, it, it happens whenever it happens, um, you know, and there's, there's you know, on some level, it's not even, when I say, you know, one can do this on demand, uh, on one level, that's true, but the experience of actually doing it is is not really the experience of control. It's really just the experience of of spontaneously recognizing what's actually already true of of your mind. And you, and you can't, you know, you remember when you remember. It's like when when do you? On some level, there's no accounting for for why that moment dawns then and not a moment before or a moment later. But it's just the moment I notice. Oh, okay, I'm, you know, uh, that's a thought. Uh, then the whole the process starts without, you know, without me having to really get behind myself and push, in some way. But you, it's it's totally useful to think certain thoughts as a kind of antidote. I mean, there there are people who have um, developed whole methods around that. I mean, it's a kind of a stylized reflection. I think you did. You have um, did you ever have Byron Katie on your podcast? I haven't. I should. Okay. I've, I've spent okay. some time with her, but I haven't had her on the podcast. I, I do find a lot of value in her framework. Uh, I mean, yeah. the series of questions and prompts and so on that she uses. Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know why I thought I'd heard you speak with her at some point, but um, yeah, I mean, she hasn't been on my podcast either. But uh, I've met her and um, never spent much time with her work. But I know she she does work this way, where she'll she'll ask questions like, you know, how do you know that's true? Right, like, mm-hmm. which which just throws everything back on this this basic fact that in in most cases the thing we're worrying about hasn't happened. Right, it's it's still hypothetical, and we're we're worrying about it as though you know that the hangman's noose is already around our necks, and you know this is this is a fait accompli, and there's there's nothing we can do about it, and you know if you, if you actually focus on the present, you know, there really is just whatever is given there and your thoughts about the past and the future. And, you know, that it does expose a, um, you know, interesting fact, which is, you know, you know, either you can do something about the problem you're worried about, or you can't. And in neither case is your stressing out about it really warrant it. I mean, if you, if you can do something about it, well, then just do something about it, you know, solve the problem. And if you can't do anything about it, well, then, you know, why suffer twice, right? I mean, you're, you're suffering now before the thing arrives, and then you're going to suffer when it arrives. You know, so on, on some level, you can decide to just, you know, be with, even if something really is a fait accompli, I mean, if, even, even if a bad thing is going to happen, and there's no way of avoiding it. I mean, one, we also know that we're we're very bad prognosticators about our future states of happiness and and misery, right? So we we tend to totally exaggerate how how much we're going to be shifted with respect to our moment to moment well being. We overestimate how positive something's going to be, and we overestimate how negative something's going to be. And you know, as we know from a lot of psychology and behavioral economics, you know, people return to baseline. Uh, fairly quickly, even from extraordinarily bad and good things happening to them, um, and uh, most of the time spent, you know, worrying about even objectively bad things is 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 still fairly delusional. I mean, we're just not actually mapping the future, the, the future that will in fact arrive at some point. Sam, I'm just curious to know, seeing the last. It's, it's arbitrary. Last few months, last year, what have you changed your mind on? What positions have you modified or reversed? What insights have you had that have sort of rendered past beliefs perhaps outdated? What have you changed your mind on in the last 
few months or year that come to mind that are really, it could be anything, material or otherwise? Mm. Um, well, I, I feel like uh, under the, the pressure of this pandemic, uh, many things are shifting for me. I think it's probably happening for, for most people, but I'm not actually consciously scoring all the changes you know, as they're happening, but I'm noticing kind of a shift in my orientation and, you know, maybe I would shift back. But for instance, you know, as you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time criticizing what I perceive to be bad ideas and, and even criticizing the people who I perceive to be, you know, purveyors of bad ideas. And so in, in political space, I, you know, I can get into some fairly heated arguments with people. And with the possible exception of President Trump, I've pulled back from, I, with the, the actual, you know, with the noted exception of President Trump, I, I've pulled back from that a lot uh, just because it strikes me as as really counterproductive. You know, so there are people who are, are saying some truly idiotic things about coronavirus. And insofar as I've engaged them in public, I've tried to be you know, fairly, I mean, it's a fairly light touch. And then, you know, I've, I have done a lot of kind of private, you know, I've attempted, you know, several private exorcisms, um, you know, because I haven't wanted to go after these people in public and get them to just dig in, you know, based on their own, you know, egos or concerns about, you know, not being shown to be wrong or whatever it is. Um, and I, I must say that the results are, are, impressively mixed. I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I've become less and less hopeful that even fairly smart people are open to, to rational argument, even when it would, would serve their interests and everyone else's interests. I mean, it's the, the communication failures around this are, are pretty spectacular. And I mean, what, so one thing I've changed my mind about, at least uh, provisionally, I mean, I, I would love to be proven wrong here, but just as a matter of, of being able to achieve some kind of political consensus around large problems, I've become far less hopeful than I was. I mean, when I think about the prospect of convincing people about climate change and then the need to respond to it, uh, when I when I map on our our, our failure to respond to coronavirus um, with the alacrity that, that was required. Uh, when I when I map that onto cl the cl problem of climate change, you know something that is so abstract, you know even in you know with one hot year following another, w even with one superstorm following the next, um, when you can't really attribute any one change in the weather to this, you know concern about climate, and uh, it's in general just a slow moving catastrophe about which there's still some some significant difference of opinion, you know, even among scientists, you know, not enough to, to discount the problem, but, you know, certainly more than around the epidemiology of coronavirus, right? And yet we can't even get on the same page around this. It, it, just, it makes me think that the solution for, for climate change has to be surreptitious at this point. Like, this, there is no political Solution. We we actually simply have to design, you know, products and and sources of energy that people find more desirable. And you know, we just you know, like you know, you know, Tesla cars being the perfect example. Like at a certain point, people just people just need to want electric cars more than they want gasoline cars for reasons that have nothing to do with climate, just because they're better cars. And we have to innovate on dozens of fronts in that way uh, and just do whatever we need to do to mitigate the problem despite the fact that we can't persuade anyone that is even a problem because I, the, the persuasion problem now just strikes me as as insuperable. So, I mean, that's kind of a, a very pessimistic epiphany I feel like I've had, but I just cannot believe how hard it is to talk to even very smart people about what's happening with coronavirus. Yeah, yeah, it's it it can be very disheartening and not to say that I am right or accurate in all things related to coronavirus, but certainly was have faced a fair amount of flack for 
speaking publicly about it, which is totally fine. People have, have a right to disagree. And I, I suppose if I'm trying to look at the silver lining in our inability to communicate, that might be a strange way to put it, is that perhaps our inability to solve one problem, like a pandemic, will uh, in some ways help us to address or at least slow down man's contribution to climate change because it'll just paralyze you know, it, <laughs> transportation it that, yeah. and factories and uh, a lot, many different large-scale forms of uh, sort of carbon carbon contribution to the atmosphere. So there, there is that. Yes, it is definitely improving our air quality for the moment. Uh, anything else that comes to mind that uh, that you've... Uh, and perhaps another way to frame it would be anything that you've been particularly surprised to learn or excited to learn about in the last year. Well, this is something that we, you and I have talked about, I don't think in, in public. I mean, this actually would have been the thing we would have spoken about at South by Southwest. Uh, but having psychedelics come back into my life after what it was was definitely more than a 25 year hiatus I mean it was at least 25 years I think you know approaching 30 since I took a, a whopping dose of, of anything uh, and I, I really it wasn't really on my radar to do again I, I forget what the proximate cause I mean I mean certainly your own recent adventures in that area were, were part of it. I mean, just it's, it's getting it's sort of in the air for, it's been in the air for, for many people in, in recent years. But, um, and I guess just the fact that it's, it's now a topic of, of um, very promising research, uh, again, um, significantly inspired by, by your commitment to it. Um, and you did yeah, an ex just, excellent. Uh, you you have an excellent podcast interview uh, on your podcast with Roland Griffiths, also. Yeah, uh, from yeah, he was John, great. Johns yeah. Hopkins, where you talked about uh, crocodile rape, among other things, <laughs> yes. or rape by crocodile. I believe. Yes, it was. the the uh, uh, the often unacknowledged <laughs> threat of being raped by a crocodile. Uh, <laughs> but um, happily, I've escaped that. But I, I have not done DMT. That's one thing I haven't tried. Uh, but yeah, so I managed to convince myself to do mushrooms. You know, a, a large, a larger dose, a larger, a larger dose of mushrooms than I've ever done. You know, in the last year, and and again, it had been um, you know over twenty five years since I had done anything significant. I, I hadn't done a lot of mushrooms when I was when when I was doing psychedelics, and I had done you know I'd, I'd done them several times, but never at a very significant dose and never, you know, blindfolded the way, um, or in the dark, the way Terrence McKenna always, uh, recommended it. And I was, I've, I was a distant, uh, fan of Terrence's for, you know, while he was alive. I, I actually met him once very briefly. I, mean, I didn't actually know him, but, uh, so I kind of, I, I view that as a missed opportunity because he really had a, a beautiful mind and, I, and, you know, I've listened to you know a ton of his stuff, and and he's just perhaps the most entertaining speaker we've ever had on on any topic. Uh, but I mean, I should say that probably half of what he said was fairly crazy. I mean, or, or at least at least <laughs> half of what half of what you know the views to which he was strongly committed, I consider to be fairly crazy and you know, some some <laughs> well, disproven. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Uh, he's so, very very entertaining. Yeah, absolutely. Continue. Yeah. I mean, he's a great. I mean, he's a great example of it. You know, almost not even mattering whether someone's right because they're just they're such a good speaker. But um, and he and he just uh, again. So I, I didn't know him. I just met him once very briefly um, in uh, 1992. He died in 2000. So I, I certainly could have hung out with him and just just didn't. And. Um, but that was a period where I was I was getting really into meditation and also uh, I was taking psychedelics, but usually LSD. And but then I just stopped because you know meditation became the center of the bullseye for me, um, and, and it still is. But after that many years, I just felt like you know, there was something I wanted to experience 
in the psychedelic space, and I recognized I had never taken mushrooms in the way that, that Terrence uh, and others had always recommended, and so I, just, I wanted to experience that. So it, I was surprised to decide it was suddenly relevant to do that, and then kind of surprised to do it, and, and also you know very happy to have had the experience I had and, and find it to be as useful as I, as I found it to be. So it was, there was kind of a, just a kind of reaming out of the pipes of my mind that seemed very useful. And I think I will certainly do that periodically. I mean, I think it's, you know, I, I didn't come away from that experience feeling like, okay, I never need to do that again. That was, uh, I'm done. It, it really did seem like a, by no means the same thing as meditation. I mean, it was, it's, it can be easily harmonized with it, but it's just not, it's just a different project on, on some level. Because in terms of transcending yourself, getting rid of this this illusion of being the subject, you know, or being the the, the, the vulnerable, you know, little man riding the, the horse of consciousness. You can do that without any of the pyrotechnics of the psychedelic experience. And, you know, conversely, I'm convinced you, you can have a, a fairly transcendent, you know, beautiful, transcendently beautiful or, or harrowing, depending, psychedelic experience without losing the sense of self, you know, or at least, you know, it's not that the experience isn't characterized much by by a, a true transcendence of self. It's just your your, your perception is, is vastly altered and your, your conceptual framework is vastly altered, but you're still a subject now either enjoying or suffering the consequences of having your your nervous system, you know, driven from below by by the pharmacology. Um, so it's, it, it is different. And, I, and again, there's no, there's no contradiction between them, but anyway, I just, I came away feeling like, yeah, it kind of, it just renewed my interest and commitment to it. But, uh, it's hard to imagine doing it in the current environment. I must say, it's like, a, like <laughs> there's so much that is now being held in abeyance by the, um, this lack of, uh, normalcy. I mean, I, I it's just, I find it very difficult to even articulate what, seems to have happened here. I mean, on, on some level, my day-to-day -day experience is changed very little. You know, I, I, you know, I count myself very lucky as someone who, you know, could, I can basically do all the work I was doing precisely as I was doing it and be essentially quarantined, right? I mean, I, you know, I was working from home anyway. My team is completely distributed, so there was, there was nothing to change there. You know, all my work with them has, has always been in Slack and on the phone and by email. And so it's like nothing has changed. And all I have to do is release podcasts and, you know, finish a book. And it just, it's all, nothing's changed. But yet, on some level, everything has changed. And I feel like we're, you know, I feel like I'm in a, you know, a spaceship where at any moment the breach in the wall can be catastrophic. Uh, and it's um, it's uh, it's a it's a very bizarre feeling, which I know everyone is is sharing to one or another degree. Question about your psychedelic experience? Well, actually, several. The first is related to a five minute or so, maybe slightly longer, five to ten minute afterward that you appended to the Roland Griffiths conversation on your podcast, which was a description of your five gram dried mushroom experience, which I thought was absolutely beautiful. Is that available, or do you have any plans to make it available outside yeah. of the app? Um, yeah, I think, actually, we're, we are just, it's either on YouTube now, or it's going to be released with um, some video backing to it. I think, like, a, like a, you know, something like, you know, a great, you know, cloud photography or something, but there's, there's something, you know, it was just an audio track, but we're, we've illustrated it with some video and then that, that should be released very soon if it's not already out. Great. Uh, yeah. What would people search to find that? Um, we, what might they search? I, I'm sure it'll be on my YouTube channel and it'll be something, I mean, I'm sure Mushroom Trip will be in the title. Sam's Excellent so, Journey. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yes, yes. Not Sam, not being Sam, raped by a crocodile. Sam and not Sam, Sam and Sam's Excellent Journey. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you guys want the crocodile rape details, you're going to have to listen to the Roland Griffiths conversation. Uh, the, 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 uh, the second question was 
related to carryover effects, if any, that you have observed uh, after recording that description of your experience? Did you see any persistent changes to your perception, behavior, or anything else? Not necessarily permanent, but persistent for a period of time, whether days or, or weeks. Did you observe anything like that? Yeah, it's, um, and this has always been true of my experience with psychedelics. And, you know, unfortunately, it it has gone in both directions. I mean, so so when I had, you know, back in the day, when I had some very unpleasant acid trips, which, you know, finally convinced me that, you know, taking acid was essentially just like a, a, a spin of the psychological roulette wheel that you know you, it's just you just don't know what number is going to come up and at that point the negative side was coming up enough that I just thought okay this really just isn't worth it and it was especially not worth it because I felt that the, the knock-on effects of having that experience for 10 or 12 hours lasted for weeks and even months like i just felt like so when i would have a a good trip which is to say you know a truly expansive uh beautiful trip uh you know the the after effects of that were uh, in the same register you know i I felt more expanded and 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 with a, a greater purchase on you know a heightened sense of beauty um and that would last for for quite some time, but you know, conversely, the the kind of contracted, neurotic, kind of shame uh, encumbered space would either that, that I would experience in a bad trip would also leave some residue for some period of time. So I, you know, I felt like a worse person for for weeks or even months after some of those trips, um, and so that's why I kind of got out of the game. But you know, th- this trip. Um, was, you know, almost entirely positive. Uh, so, yeah, as a, a kind of emotional and, and perceptual reference point, um, yeah, I felt a, a, you know, I felt better in, in many ways afterwards. And, um, I think I probably still do. I mean, again, it's not, it's not permanent in the sense that it's, it's not that, it has blocked every other state of consciousness from arising thereafter. I mean, so, you know, after that trip, which now is, you know, several months old, um, you know, I've experienced anxiety, I've experienced fear, I've experienced anger, I've experienced, you know, every, everything is still on the menu. But as a reference point, it has stayed pretty vivid. So, it's just it's easier to convince yourself that like when you've had an experience like that, and this is this really is the 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 reason to take psychedelics, even if you are convinced that they're unnecessary and that that, that they're neither necessary nor sufficient, right? So that they're they're um, I mean, if you, even if you're convinced that meditation is the only way to really transform your mind in the way that you want to, the thing about psychedelics is that it can give you, I mean, and, and as you know, you know, each in, in different ways, they can give you an experience of states of consciousness which, for which there, there is no possibility of skepticism. As a meditator, for the longest time, I mean, for really, for forever, I mean, so that you, you, it, can, it can just torpedo the whole project, you can remain fundamentally uncertain as to whether or not there's a there there you know it's like like is this really going to work is there really something to notice here is there i mean does life ever really get any better than it's been in the last five minutes you know is is there anything to realize or maybe i'm just fooling myself right like all of it you can you can cycle in that space of doubt uh for for years and years and 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 get absolutely nowhere but you know, f- you know, five grams of mushrooms, if nothing else, prove to you that it is possible to have just an unrecognizably different experience of consciousness, and you know that that's available given the requisite stimulus, right? And the, and you know, your the drug doesn't get your brain to do something that your brain isn't capable of doing, 
right? It's not like it's not like you've been given a different brain. The, the same serotonergic system that is being uh, leveraged by psychedelics is, you know, always there working for you, and it gets leveraged in, in every moment or or not based on how you use your attention and based on the kinds of you know your the collisions you have in the world and you know every just everything else you're doing neurophysiologically and it is uh, it's just absolutely possible to have a very different moment to moment experience of the world and and most of us I, I consider myself among the the untalented people who really pr- probably just would not have seen the merits of meditation but for the fact that i had had a psychedelic experience in that, in that case with MDMA which just proved to me that there had to be a there there that you know that, that people you know in, in the various contemplative traditions who were talking about things like unconditional love they weren't they weren't making this up they weren't just epileptics or frauds um, you know these this there is a, this is a real continuum of human consciousness that is there to be explored and you just have to figure out how to make your mind adequate to that project. Um, and, and psychedelics definitely reveal that. It, it is just incredible how different the experiences can be on different compounds, even though they may fall or be thought of as falling into the same category of, say, psychedelics. To take two, which are often thought of as, as close cousins, and uh, on some level, they are similar. But uh, you take, say, LSD, which is, from a receptor standpoint, quite promiscuous with the duration of effect that you, that you mentioned, which can be really long, right? Eight to yeah. 12 hours, which, uh, on one hand, it, it's tempting to say, well, that's Earth time, it doesn't really matter. Uh, <laughs> just like f- when people say, oh, I'm going to do DMT because it lasts 5 to 15 minutes, I-, I don't think that's the proper way to frame the decision or think about it, <laughs> because that-, that could feel like a thousand lifetimes strung together in terms of your your subjective experience of those 15 minutes. But nonetheless, uh, say LSD, just in terms of duration of effect and then you look at say mushrooms four to six hours generally there are different species of course and all sorts of variables what what i find and what many people find difficult about lsd there are there are a few things number one it is so potent on a microgram level that it is easy to misdose and the difference between 100 micrograms and 200 micrograms is uh, hard to overstate how yeah. how different mm-hmm. those two experiences can be. And uh, that is a drop, <laughs> less than a drop, I mean, depending on how it's being administered. Right. Uh, and then the uh, I think what makes for many people, and I'd be curious to hear your perspective on this, but mushrooms somewhat easier to navigate is that the on-ramp and the off-ramp, the on-ramp is a little longer, uh, generally, than, than LSD, so the, the full onset and peak of effects, if you're looking at the pharmacokinetics, but the off-ramp is generally, for most people, going to be a lot faster than uh, LSD, in the sense that with LSD, you might have, and many people do have the experience of being fully journeying in some transcendent psychedelic experience, dissolution of the self, etc., for four to five hours. And then there is this tail of an additional two to four hours. And there are a fair number of people who will have 24 hour plus experiences. Uh, I don't know who knows what the exact. Uh, percentage of the population is, but uh, having volunteered at Zendo, which is a psychedelic harm reduction volunteer outfit at places like Burning Man and so on, you, let's call it one in 30 people would be my estimate, have a 24 hour plus response. But let's just go with the majority. You have this tail end of two to six hours where you are not sober, you are absolutely not sober. You're still very malleable and everything is intensified, but you are not journeying. And Mm. so I I find that that in-between space can be quite 
challenging to navigate because you're no, for a lot of folks that they've taken the eye mask off, maybe the music's playing, maybe they're trying to eat crackers with their friends, and then they have this huge surge of shame or other intense emotion. Yeah. But intellectually, they think that they are in control, so to speak. <laughs> right. And yeah. uh, that, that can cause all sorts of difficulties that can persist as as you mentioned uh yeah when you're uh, when you're eating a cracker with both hands that's a telltale sign that you're <laughs> you're, you're not yet fully in control <laughs> uh, right and, yeah yeah if you're holding your trisket with more right. than more than yes. eight eight fingers it's it's right. probably a sign that you're not fully sober uh, uh yeah well so, you know this this gets to an issue of of um on some level a, a dose that's too small runs a, a liability that that is, uh, you know, on some level even greater than a dose that's too large. Or at least, I mean, this is, this is the way I've I've begun to think about it based on my experience. It, it's just the. Um, I mean, first we should say that the for, for psychedelics like psilocybin, uh, uh, mushrooms, and um, LSD. You know, you're you're nowhere near a a lethal dose of the compound at at any dose you're you're liable to, to take. You know, even the most um, aggressive uh, and um, you know psychologically destabilizing dose, you know, f- physiologically is not likely to be toxic for you. Mm-hmm. So that, that's not an argument for taking as much as you can get your hands on. It's just that these are you know, physically very safe drugs. Um, and I, I would definitely not say that of MDMA. I mean, MDMA you can clearly overdose on, but you just, can, yeah, you can yeah. clearly die hyperthermia. Yeah. I've seen people in the same volunteer capacity at different events, 104, 105 degree temperatures, which is how right. you melt your, melt your brain uh, and can die. Certainly, uh, ibogaine or iboga also can have some severe cardiac complications and people do die of cardiac arrest using ibogaine and iboga so you really have to know your compound but yeah. psilocybin and lsd have effectively no known ld50 meaning a dose that would be expected to kill say 500 of a thousand people in a room if they were given that dose which can be established for lots of things including some common drugs like acetaminophen which can be very dangerous so right right so yeah so it's not and again i'm sure people have had heart attacks and and strokes and other uh you know even fatal events on lsd or psilocybin and and maybe as a consequence of of what's happening for them psychologically being part of that but um it's just that the we we just know that the the drugs themselves are, are physically very well tolerated, and so it's you know the, that so that's not the the concern. Um, but now I've forgotten how, why I got into that. Um, the um, let's see, I was talking about the duration of these two. Oh compounds. right, okay, yeah. So sorry, and then we're talking okay, about so. Triscuits eating it with ten fingers, right, right. indicative yeah, so, of not being sober. Yeah. So the reason, so the reason to take more rather than less for me. Um, or, or, or the reason why um, you know, just kind of imagining you're just going to get your toe in the water. I'm, I'm leave, leave aside microdosing as its own thing. I'm, I'm not talking about that. But like the, the reason why maybe uh, five grams of mushrooms could be better than two grams of mushrooms uh, for somebody is that, uh, and you, know, you can you can do the arithmetic for LSD. There is that taking enough reliably launches you past all of your personal psychological content, right? And the place I don't like to be and and the place I don't recommend people spending much time is in the domain of one's personal concerns, life concerns, you know, the kinds of thoughts that besiege you when you're when you sit down to meditate to get to stay on that strata of your mind with you know, with this turbocharged experience of psilocybin or LSD, you know, driving you there, um, you know that for the most part, I mean, I, I, you, you obviously can have personal insights and you can you can have kind of breakthroughs with respect to your relationship 
uh, to other people. You know, I, I know that's the case, but generally speaking, it, it is a a recipe for a lot of you know seemingly you know very personal anguish, which you can you can actually bypass if you if you go far enough out and then you and 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 have a have a, a truly you know transcendent experience at least transcendent in the sense that you are what you're in contact with doesn't have a reference point in your in your life right you're not thinking about your mom or your wife or your you know, like for, you, on the, on the way out you might be and on the way back you might be but where you land when you know you're actually at the peak is a place that doesn't have those kinds of reference points. And again, it can, it can be very, very beautiful or it can be very, very painful. I mean, it's, it's not, doesn't guarantee a, a, a quote, good trip. Uh, but it's, um, uh, I mean, that for me, that's the real opportunity of, of true psychedelics, unlike something like MDMA, where, you know, to be working on your relationships and to be thinking about specific people in your life or even relating directly to them, um, you know, that, that, is a seems like a much a totally appropriate use of that tool. I I, I agree. I, th- I think MDMA is is uh, better described as an empathogen uh, yeah. than a psychedelic. I don't think of it as a psychedelic at all. Uh, there's there's some dispute over how to apply that term to different things. But I would um, I would add to what you said that. Uh, that uh, the, the the analogy I use, I guess, metaphor quite a lot when discussing this with people is that of airplane, taxi, and takeoff. And the experience of popping through the clouds. So you have this taxiing period, you're waiting, you're waiting, you have this acceleration, takeoff, uh, a slight amount of turbulence. And then very often as you go through cloud cover, you have even more turbulence, and then you pop through the clouds, and you have hopefully a smooth ride, or at least a ride from a very, very, very different vantage point. And to your point about dosage, if we're talking about, say, mushrooms, one of the psychological risks of underdosing, and which is quite common because people are understandably nervous, and uh, very often this is done in settings where people do not have a sitter, which I always recommend mm. against, meaning if someone doesn't have a sitter, they're likely to want to dose more conservatively and in doing so often take something, let's just say, in the one to two gram range and end up stuck in the clouds right. in, tur- in turbulence. And they never quite pop above the clouds into a transpersonal, or even if they still have the identification of I, the what constitutes I changes quite a lot. Yeah. Right? In the psychedelic experience, you can have complete ego dissolution. You can have complete, what I would perhaps call disassembly <laughs> at higher doses, where you, your experience does not resemble your ordinary waking reality in any sense whatsoever. Yeah, time, dimension, language all disappear, I disappears, etc. But ratcheting that down, you can have the experience of I, Tim, am experiencing these various things, but what constitutes I and the boundaries that normally exist in your waking life that separate you cleanly from the external world are very permeable, very different. And, uh, the related point with, say, LSD is that on the descent, instead of just going straight through the clouds, you sort of hang out in the clouds or can yeah. for a pretty extended period of time. And, and that is where you can come out of a beautiful transcendent experience. And this is not, by the way, a knock on LSD. I think it's a tremendously interesting tool for the right people with the right supervision. But uh, there is a tail end where many people perceive their journey to be over where very messy personal material can come up with strong emotional charge. And they're simply not 
they've taken their seatbelt off and they're going to get their luggage <laughs> out of the overhead right. compartment and they're right, still right. and they're still in the clouds they just don't realize it <laughs> you know yeah uh, so yeah. it's uh, you know these things are very very strong they're very they can be very powerful so i i always you know advise caution with these things um well, well and, even in the, even in the best case when you're talking about the the come down uh from let's say LSD Let's say you've had a, a perfectly expansive, you know, beautiful, transcendent trip, and then you're coming down. Uh, you know, what I remember from those experiences, and, and probably the first 10 acid trips I took were I literally had not a single moment where I, I could even understand what was meant by the concept of a bad trip. I, mean, I, I remember being the guy who was thinking, what are people talking about? You know, a bad trip. Like it just, there was no, I, I couldn't figure out where would you point your finger to, to you know, it, in which direction could you possibly go in that experience to wind up someplace bad? I mean, it just made no sense to me. And then, then uh, on some subsequent trip, it made all too much sense. <laughs> Famous last words. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Talk about hubris. Um, but uh, anyway, so, but even from these trips, I, I remember coming down the experience was one of feeling my mind encumbered by the, the very, you know, artifices and structures and kind of diversions of attention, you know, con on concerns, psychological concerns on some level that block the the expansive experience I had just had, right? So, you know, you, you come down, you, you like one moment you feel like Jesus and the next moment... <laughs> You begin to notice the reasons, the, the kind of rapidly accruing reasons why you're not quite qualified to be Jesus, right? And <laughs> and and then, and you and if you're in relationship to people, I mean, if you're actually having a conversation with someone who you were just tripping with, say, um, you know, th that begins all of that begins to to fall into place in dialogue with others. I mean, and and you notice your neurosis. Or at least your potential for neurosis to kind of get re reconstructed in front of you, um, and you know, as you moment by moment, and that I remember that being painful. I mean, just to witness kind of the capture of my attention in something that you know moments before would have been unthinkable, right? And uh, yeah, you go from uh, Jesus to Woody Allen in your own yeah, head exactly, in about sixty exactly, seconds, yeah. right? Right. <laughs> and you've got bad hair in either case. <laughs> you know i just i just envy anyone with hair so that's where right, I am right. There, there is no there is no bad hair <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i i hope at some point i mean it, this this would be quite a distance in the future i would imagine that we will actually have scientific studies looking at the combination of these compounds, for instance, using MDMA or other empathogens, there are quite a few that could be used as an on-ramp for, say, LSD therapy or psilocybin uh, and combination therapy that, that I think could be very, very interesting. Uh, we, don't, we don't yet have the data we need and want for these compounds in isolation. So I think that's a fair distance in the future, but I, I look forward to the day when more of that can be done. Right, uh, right. Yeah. The, the one thing I'm looking forward to, which I mentioned at the end of this, this addendum that, that is at the end of the podcast with, with Roland, um, there's, there was that one study done combining a meditation retreat with a high dose psilocybin experience. And that for me seems like a great Marriage. I mean, just to prepare people over the course of a couple of days with mindfulness practice, and you know, I'm sure there's there's some way to to optimize this protocol. It wouldn't just be straight silence. I mean, there there might be some uh, you know reflection about you know what what's coming, and then some integration period. But just to actually kind of systematize a a retreat like approach to doing a a high dose psychedelic experience that that seems um very promising <laughs> the, the, the people who are doing it 
What are, you, what, are you, what are you guessing? Oh, no, I'm laughing because I'm just imagining. I did a silent retreat at Spirit Rock, and there were you know, 200 people sitting in this meditation hall. And I was just thinking, <laughs> if you had 200 people doing a high-dose psychedelic <laughs> journey in one room, it would be anything but a silent retreat. <laughs> right. That's, yeah. <laughs> It's a very crowded retreat. Um, <laughs> it might not have been 200, but I would say at least, I mean, at least 80, somewhere between 80 yeah. and 100. Yeah, I think it's about 100 up there, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I see. so how you physically, I mean, how you arrange the environment and, and how you keep people in their own space and give them adequate guidance and all of that, I don't know how that's brought off. I know there, there are places that are doing it. There's one in... Jamaica, there was one in Holland. I mean, a bunch of these places, and there's one in Mexico. A bunch got in touch with me after this podcast. As far as I can tell, none are really as as um, uh, locked down in their their protocols as I. Uh, I mean, they didn't seem like places I could I could recommend based on what I could see of what they were no, doing. No Facebook uh, ads with your face for psychedelic <laughs> exactly. retreats anytime soon. <laughs> they, they, yeah, they they may <laughs> someone may have produced some, but they're not they're not, uh, they're not authorized. So if you see any, let me know. Yeah, one what one uh, comment I want to add. Uh, as it relates to difficult psychedelic experiences or psychedelic experience overall is there is a common pattern among first time or relatively novice users of psychedelics to develop somewhat of a Messiah complex after mm. they've seen the promised land. Yeah. And they, have one experience or two experiences. Very often it's after one. They have this profound transformative experience and they become a proselytizer for psychedelic use. And grandma, you need to do ayahuasca. You know, little little Johnny, <laughs> nephew Johnny, you need to do ayahuasca, etc. Which is uh, at best irresponsible and, and also very, very dangerous. And so my recommendation to people who are experimenting with psychedelics or considering it, number one, the legal side effects can be uh, just as great as any other side effects. So I'm not advising Nora San that you break the law. Uh, secondly, if nonetheless you are going to experiment, I would ask that you put enough mileage uh, under your belt to at least once be, uh, as I sometimes say to my friends, uh, tumbled and humbled before you are given your card-carrying capabilities of proselytizing psychedelics. Mm. It's, it's my strong feeling that you need to have uh, not what I would consider a bad trip, because I, I only distinguish between safe and unsafe trips, not good and bad. I think some of the most valuable experiences you can have are exceptionally difficult psychedelic experiences in exceptionally safe circumstances. Right. But if if you're simply getting the sort of unicorns pissing rainbows version of the psychedelic <laughs> experience, and those are your first three or four innings, keep going possibly, safely, obviously, until you have a harrowing, holy fucking shit experience that takes you a while to digest and process before you run around like the town crier telling everyone they should do psychedelics. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's good advice because you, there's no way to appreciate how difficult a, quote, bad trip can be uh, unless you've had one. Right, and if you and in, in fact, if you've only had good trips, you're really you're almost the worst judge of what is possible for somebody else uh, and, yeah. and for for yourself at some future time point. So, um, yeah, I mean that was uh, I, I, I was actually one of those people, you know, back in the day when I first because I was taking psychedelics the first time around before. Um, I was kind of in this, in this weird cohort because I was, you know, in my peer group, I was kind of the only person doing what I was doing. I mean, I, the, you know, when I, would, when I would go on a meditation retreat when I was, you know, 20 or 21, there were, there were no other 
20 and 21 year olds on these retreats. I mean, everyone was, everyone had kind of been through the 60s. And, and you know, so I was, I was surrounded by, you know, 40 and 50 year olds who were, who had been doing this stuff for 20 years or so. And, um, and so it was with psychedelics. So, so when I got my hands on MDMA, it, would, it, it had come out of, you know, ecstasy, it had come out of the therapeutic community right after, it, it, it was a couple of years after it was made Schedule One. And but I didn't know anyone. I mean, perhaps there were many people my age taking it, but I, I just wasn't aware of it. I didn't know anyone who had taken it. So when I got my hands on psychedelics and meditation, and the, the, you know, the combination of all of these esoteric things, and kind of rebooted the '60s for myself, I was <laughs> <laughs> your private your private re- revival yeah, of the '60s. Yeah, exactly. You know, I was a one man. Uh, I was a one man Grateful Dead tour. Um, <laughs> Uh, without ever getting into the dead, uh, but I w- just was not meeting. I just there was no one in my world who who knew anything about any of this stuff. So, yeah, I was kind of proselytizing, and you know, I, I guided you know many people on on uh, psychedelic trips. You know, but I just just branded myself somebody who was qualified to do this after I don't know half a dozen acid trips. And you know nothing, <laughs> nothing especially bad happened, um, but you know obviously I was I didn't have the the experience that one would want to have to actually be doing that, and uh, yeah, it's um, it's a little bit like what happened to me when I, when I got into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I mean, the moment I got into that, it was like every every conversation had to be about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> 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 and that lasted until I got, you know, injured, and uh, uh, yeah. So now I now I have a slightly different conversation about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> you should really you should really try it. Oh wait, oh I didn't tell you. Yeah, wait, last week I'm, I had I'm, both of my Achilles with tendons now. torn. <laughs> yeah, asterisk. Uh, the yeah, <laughs> yeah it's. Um, Psychedelics are still endlessly fascinating to me. Uh, they they do not, they have not in any way uh, lost their fascination for me. But, so, but what about in the current environment? I mean, can you imagine tripping now, or is it just, it, does it just seem like well, uh, at, at the, at the wrong risk of, set and setting? Well, at the at the risk of being really negligent uh, or, or irresponsible. I, I will say that I, I cannot say with I'm going to word this like a lawyer would. Uh, I I cannot be a hundred percent confident that there would be no value in, in uh, safe and responsible use of psychedelics during these times. In, in part because these times are not going to be. Sh- this is not a. It's not two weeks. This is not a ninety minute movie that we're watching. Yeah. This is this is going to yeah. be an extended period of time. And I think there could be applications for people who have a lot of experience. I don't think this is necessarily the time to decide you're going to uh find some homebrew instructions for ayahuasca plus ingredients on the dark web and do a solo journey into the dark night of the soul. I don't think that's a good idea by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but for people with a lot of experience, I, I, I do think there, there could be applications. There are probably more applications for something like MDMA, which allows you to process a lot while not deactivating, but down-regulating fear response, mm. if that makes sense. Uh, part of the reason, and I'm, I'm not giving a neurochemical or uh, pharmacological explanation here, but MDMA can be incredibly effective for treating post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, some of the results are unbelievable. I mean, if, if you look at the studies MAPS has been uh, designing and funding and implementing in some cases, you have patients with 17 years, median 17 years or 17 and a half years, I think this is from their phase two trials, persistent PTSD, severe symptoms, who after one or two sessions with MDMA, granted, plus lots of integration and prep and post work uh, with 
yeah. uh, very highly trained, generally highly trained therapists who go from severe to asymptomatic after one or two sessions. Now, that raises many questions. And one is, how the hell can that possibly work? And uh, I'm going to, I'm sure, bastardize this and uh, should probably have Rick Doblin on the podcast at some point to actually fact check and correct me on things, but I feel like I know what they're doing pretty well. And uh, subjectively, I would say also from my experience that MDMA and certain compounds like it allow you to revisit trauma or examine trauma, whether lowercase t or capital T, from a somewhat detached observer perspective as an adult so you can recontextualize and process that trauma without re-traumatizing yourself. And mm. uh, that's not always the case. Uh, and, and I should also say that uh, MDMA, perhaps more so than psychedelics, is thought to be a love drug where it's always running through fields and handing each other flowers. And that is not the case. People can have tremendously difficult experiences that require a lot of triage afterwards. And I've seen a, a lot of video footage of actual sessions within the context of training and people can have a very tough time. This can, this can also mm -hmm. open up Pandora's box where afterwards people have said things, for instance, they feel tremendous shame about, etc. So it's not without risk. There are risks, but for people who have experience, I, I think that MDMA could possibly be a tool that helps them to downregulate fear and anxiety response and process some of what is happening to them in a way that allows them to be more sort of proactive instead of reactive afterwards. That doesn't mean I'm recommending mm. people do MDMA right now, but I, I do think that if I had to choose between MDMA and psychedelics, I would probably choose MDMA. Right. Well, I recommend that you um, wipe down the box that the MDMA comes in. With a, with <laughs> yeah, difficult. The, 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 wipe. the question of procurement <laughs> is a whole right. separate uh, a whole separate uh, topic that is probably best not discussed on a podcast. <laughs> right. stay, stay six feet away from your MDMA dealer. <laughs> just, just lob the MDMA <laughs> over the fence. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, yeah. so that, I suppose there is, those are a few of my thoughts. Uh, but people are struggling right now. People are struggling, and I think it, you know, in many respects people are having a psychedelic, millions of people are having a psychedelic experience right now in so much as this set of crises and this pandemic has acted much like LSD as a nonspecific amplifier of everything that's underneath the surface. And mm. if you have mild anxiety disorders or tendencies to anxiety that can be managed under normal circumstances, there's a good chance that that is magnified right now. If you have a path... Well, well just think know. about, forget about the health concerns aside. I mean, I, you know, I, I think you and I are on the same page in having worried up until this moment that, that people aren't taking the health implications seriously enough. That that really, it hasn't been that we've been too panicked by this, it's just that we, we actually haven't been worried enough early enough to take the steps that we need to take to actually get off these exponential curves and, and um, mitigate the spread of this contagion. But forget about the virus. If, if there were just some invisible force that were having the, the economic effects that we're now witnessing, that would be a civilization-rattling form of stress for almost everyone. I mean, you and I are in uniquely fortunate circumstances in that, you know, we're, we're, um, we're both well off and uh, able to more or less work, you know, almost as we were before. I mean, you know, apart yeah. from not doing live events or anything else yeah. of, of that sort, you know, we're, we can more or less just continue going. Um, but m most people are, are not in that situation. And, so even if there was just no concern about the possibility that, that you or anyone you love is going to wind up in an ICU on a ventilator, uh, which is going to 
which is happening and is going to increasingly happen to to many many people. Leaving all that aside, um, you know, people are you know understandably uh, terrified about the the economic volatility we're seeing. But you know, it's 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 not just up and down and up and down. It's you know, it's in certain sectors just down and down and down and down with no end in sight. You know, if you look at the service sector, if you look at restaurants, I mean, all of that is is very scary, especially given the way in which, um, I mean, it, it interacts with everything. It's just that the, the way in which our society is is so lacking in resilience based on, you know, there not being a, a great safety net, even though we're, tr- we're trying to provide one on the fly here with, you know, trillions of dollars. Um, and there's a level of wealth inequality that is is just magnifying this problem, uh, and then there's a, a political layer to it that is you know increasingly toxic. Where you know one side of the aisle is is um, you know fairly delusional in the degree which they're denying the nature of the problem, and the other side is um, you know in in the worst case just willing to make politics out of out of a, a pandemic and it's we, like we, we can't even talk to each other about you know how to solve the most basic human problems so it's it's incredibly stressful you know leaving aside the the actual reality of the pandemic it is it is i've uh and and you're absolutely right i mean we're in very fortunate positions i have family members friends who've been laid off from all types of jobs not just service industry jobs. I think the service industry is the canary in the coal mine. And it's, uh, I've struggled, you know, I've, I've struggled with what to do to maximally help also. I think I've been, I don't think, I know I've been sort of beating myself up a lot about, uh, not doing enough or perhaps not doing the right things, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot. Do you have people in your life? Like, has this been happening one to one, where you have you know friends and and family members who you've had to burn a lot of fuel uh, trying to convince to take this seriously, or is it? Are you talking ju- just about your public messaging about it? Oh, it, it's both. It's both. I mean, mm-hmm. I I, th- I think that um, because I discussed this publicly quite early. I want to say the first blog post I put up about it was the second or third week of February, which I caught a lot of hell for. And then the campaigning for cancellation of South by, which I caught a lot of hell for. So that, that was actually quite easy because I was, I had a high degree of conviction that this was inevitable on some level, given the mathematics involved and the, 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 the fine details of the metrics could be off and the case fatality rates and this, that, and the other thing could be off. But even if they were off by 50% in either direction, <laughs> uh, nonetheless, I mean, the, the, the picture emerging was very clear to me. So I felt good about that. I think what's been difficult is having many of the people who initially didn't take it seriously getting caught on their heels in really bad positions with family member family members to account for and so on in mm-hmm. different locations who then came to me for help with everything and I just I couldn't right. handle it I could and by not handle it I don't mean emotionally I mean it was logistically impossible hundreds of text messages and it's just like I can't take 6 hours on e- with each of these people to get them up to speed it's not physically possible uh so it's uh, it's been challenging and i don't mean to make it a it's not a sob story because there there are many millions of people who are going to be having a much harder time and i guess the you know, the question that that comes to mind for me to you and um is you know what would you recommend to people who are scared or suffering right now uh, recognizing there are real external factors to consider, but also recognizing that we often suffer twice or suffer when we need not suffer, at least in our minds, by imagining worst case scenarios and perseverating on 
worst case scenarios and being consumed by fear. Are, are there are there any recommendations that you would make to people who are fearful or confused in these times? I know that's very broad and maybe asking a lot, but how would you respond to that? Well, I guess, I guess the the place from which I'm, you know, I, I can be fairly prescriptive is toward all the people who are in situations similar to our own. I mean, in the sense that, I mean, there, there are people who are, are in totally non-analogous situations to our own who, for whom, you know, the choice to stay home is, is not possible, right? In right. fact, it would be a, a an abdication of their own ethical responsibilities if they were to stay home. I mean, there are people who, you know, need to work in our ICUs and there are people who need to deliver food and, you know, they keep the supply chain running. It's like all these people are heroes for just doing their jobs. And so I view the ethical imperative to get out of circulation uh, and not increase the, the you know, disease burden and, and the, the burden on our healthcare system. Uh, you know, that, that falls to everyone else who, who can do their work from home, who, who, for whom, you know, the being out in the world is not actually helpful to anyone. Um, and so those are two very different sets of people. And so, you know, the people who are out there doing the, ne- the necessary work of, of keeping everything running, you know, all of – I consider all of them, you know, heroes wh- whose way I want to get out of, right? I want us all to get out of their way and not make it any more likely that they are, g- are going to get sick or that they are going to be unable to, to – if, if they're in healthcare, you know, care for the people who are already sick or, you know, soon to be sick or sick now and don't know it. Um, and But for the people who can – reinvent themselves or you know step away from from their their careers and jobs and uh um and especially for the people who are in in fortunate enough positions to not actually have to sweat the financial implications of this in the near term um i just think there's there's a, there's a different set of ethical considerations that come online i mean just i think we we should we should just be looking for opportunities to help the people who are more vulnerable than we are. I mean, so you know, if I mean, there, so like you, all of us have people in our lives who we employ, however peripherally. You know, I mean, just like you take the person who cuts your hair if you have hair. I will leave you out of this, Tim. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I still have some of my hair, and um, you know, so it's just like. You know, I know how often I get a haircut. Well, I know I'm not getting a haircut for I don't know, I don't know when the next haircut's going to going to happen. But you know, why not you know buy some imaginary haircuts here and and keep help keep the person who cuts my hair afloat during this period. Um, so anything like that that you can think of doing right to support people who you know are taking. You know, in many cases, a hundred percent hit to their their economic well being. It just seems if if you're in a position to be able to do that, you should, right? And and that's um, uh, and so you know, I would just advocate that we we recognize that we are we're all part of a system here. We're all connected and in in a, in, in the most basic material ways, and you know, we're all reliant on on uh, everyone else not breaking down and failing here, and and uh, and so our effort to keep our world together can't be solitary. I mean, it can't be solitary at the national level, and it can't be solitary at the the individual family level. I mean, it's just it it can't be merely about making sure you have enough food in your house. Uh, because you can't possibly have enough food in your house so that you are no longer reliant on the supply chain and on the service worker who would, you know, deliver the food from the the market that you're now scared to go to. Um, that person still has to have a viable, you know, source of, of funds. And um, so it's, anyway, it's just to, to, to view our connections, to keep, to keep our connectedness to the people we know, certainly, and, and even the people we don't, um, more in mind here as we as we hunker down as we should. I mean, again, I, I really do think it is an imperative for us to 
to understand collectively. I mean, now speaking as you know, for the with the country in mind. I mean, it, this can't even be a state by state effort. We can't. You know, it's all of us who are who are out of circulation now are more or less just waiting for everyone else to get the message because if this is going to go on for a very very long time, if we can't extinguish it uh, and slow the contagion you know, over the next couple of months. And um, it's only it's only by doing that and then all the subsequent, you know, testing and contact tracing that we're actually going to return the world and, and the economy to something like normal. I mean, there, there, is, there is no rebooting of this economy with a contagion like this raging and people falling sick in the numbers that they will. I mean, we're just, what we're, what we're going to do is just pendulum swing back and forth from you know, trying to restart the economy and then realizing, oh my God, this is just too scary. The, you know, I just saw a crazy documentary about what what's really happening in the hospitals, and okay, now I'm going back into hiding. And you know, we're going to have that that experience on a collective level over the course of months, and it's uh, it's just going to be needlessly costly in terms of lives and our economic well being. Uh, whereas the truth is we could resolve this in something like a month if we had our act together. I mean, literally, we could lock down for a month and this would burn itself out. If uh, if, if they did it correctly. Yeah, if yeah. they did it correctly. That would require isolating in fever clinics or elsewhere family members who are positive from their families. Yeah. Sadly, but yes, or, or or family. So even in you know worse case than that, just you know everyone isolating in their homes, and then maybe the rest of the family would get it, and then you know then whoever would have to go to the hospital would go to the hospital. But as long as we're six feet away from everyone other than our family members um, and out of circulation, we could this this thing could self extinguish. It's just we're not showing any kind of aptitude for doing that because of the just the nature of our political conversation mainly yeah and and to echo what you said a little bit earlier my impression looking at the confusion and hopelessness and frustration among many of my friends and this is not limited to people who are as as fortunate as we are uh this is even lots of folks i know who say uh, are gardeners or house cleaners who also want to help in some fashion the question that i get very often from top to bottom is which nonprofit should i give money to and I think that will become clearer as things progress, but right now there are a thousand chickens with their heads cut off running around trying to help and really confusing things. There are a few signals in the noise. I think Flexport, flexport.org yeah. forward slash donate is doing excellent work. Uh, Operation masks.org I find interesting, although uh, I don't understand all of it. But there's a lot of confusion. And in the meantime, there are things, as you said, that you can do to help just by focusing on the people you know. If you look back, you're just say a, a, a typical week from six months ago. What did it look like Monday to Sunday? And you can identify the coffee shop. You can identify the restaurants. You can identify uh, people you may have paid for God knows what on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, doesn't mean you have to feel obligated by yourself to subsidize all of those folks. But what you could do is ask the question that, that I, was, <laughs> I was, uh, was told was the most important at the beginning, actually, of a rafting trip, my first ever rafting trip. And Kelly Starrett, who's an incredible guy, uh, the ready state, incredible PT, incredible athletic performance coach, all around good guy. And he used to be an Olympic level kayaker. And he said to everybody who was on the trip, because he was co-organizing it, he said, the most important four words that you can utter are how can I help? How can I help? If you're if if people are doing stuff and your hands are empty, how can I help? And what I've noticed, at least in having conversations with people I've offered to help, that oftentimes it's just asking, how can I help? Can I help you? That is in and of itself helpful. Does that make sense? 
It doesn't yeah. have it doesn't have to translate to them accepting your help or asking for help, uh, but just reaching out and making the offer and indicating that it's a standing offer, even if they don't accept it now, I, th- I think is is tremendously psychologically helpful. Uh, so you don't have to wait for the perfect nonprofit to present itself. You can talk to those people who you already know. Yeah, yeah, and it's also just worth remembering how disruptive this emergency is and how how unique it is. I mean, this is a, by its very nature, this is dividing us from uh, ourselves. I mean, this this is separating people. I mean, just think of what it's like to have someone die now and, you know, the decision about whether to have a funeral or not. I mean, in most cases, it's a, a straightforward decision of just not to do that, you know, and, and, and just think of the implications of that. Um, I mean, the rest of life is going on, you know, and, you know, and all the bad parts of life are still going on. People are, are getting sick and dying from causes that have nothing to do with coronavirus. And, you know, all of that's be being made more difficult and just, you know, deciding whether you have to see a doctor for some other reason now is, is incredibly stressful. Um, and so there's just so much going on now that, that it's, um, people are under a a ton of stress. Uh, and again, it's, um, it's, it's almost perfectly designed to, uh, be hard to solve. You know, it's, it's not like, I mean, initially, the the analogy to September 11th came to everyone's mind. It's like this. Okay, this is yet another intrusion of history. You know, this is another moment where we need to wake up and realize. Okay, the um, the society destabilizing events are are still you know still on the menu, right? This is you, we this you, this is the kind of thing you're living through now that that people will be talking about long after you're gone. Um, but on, on another level, this is, this is totally unanalogous to September 11th. I mean, it just, it is, it's much, it's a much bigger deal. Uh, and it's much harder to respond to intelligently. Um, and it's not to say we responded to September 11th with, with much intelligence, but, um, it's, uh, this is big and, and, and no one alive has, really gone through something quite like this. I mean, it's been, it's, this is outside of everyone's lived experience, you know, how to, how to deal with this. Yeah. And what, what I would add to that is that, I don't I don't know if this will be helpful, but uh, speaking from a personal perspective, you know, I've been beating myself up for not having clear frameworks for making decisions, not feeling clarity around many things, not knowing how to help optimally or being able to figure it out. And the fact of the matter is, it makes very little sense for me to beat myself up about that because it is not, at least not always, reflective of a personal flaw. It's a collective experience that millions of people are having right now. This is this is very different from anything anyone living has ever faced. And that's not to say that the the world as we know it is going to hell in a handbasket. I'm not saying that. But the the circumstances and the problems and the challenges that have been created are, are very different from 9-11 or anything else that we associate with national or global crisis. Very, very different. So it's I think helpful to try to remember that, and uh, I'm saying this as much for my own benefit as anyone else, to be gentle with oneself and compassionate if you can be, because it's not difficulties. The difficulties that most people are facing are not reflective of any individual flaw. They are reflective of a, 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 a terrifying and unique situation and the response of millions of people collectively. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, there's so many cases where it's not reflective of a flaw at all. It's just, it's just, you're in a sector of the economy where, um, you know, obviously you're getting zeroed out, right. Just because of the nature of the problem. It's like, just imagine, you know, owning 
the best restaurant in New York City, right? You know, you you may not survive this interruption in your activity through no fault of your own. You know, it's just it's a um, this really is like a, a, um, a stray bullet on that level that just hits you. So you, you, that's why we need. I mean, there's there are silver linings here. I mean, we we need to to um, notice all the ways in which our assumptions and our ideologies and our you know our cherished notions about how the world should be are not serving us well here. I mean, they, they to take you know the uh, fashionable ideas in in the tech community. I mean, there, there a lot of people in tech who are either avowed libertarians or you know quasi libertarians or just you know fans of Ayn Rand, but they have this basic idea that you know the government is is useless and and the less we have of it the better um we are really suffering under a lack of effective governance now and you know the, the, there are certain lessons here that that should be indelible uh, and one is you know you can't rely on a piecemeal private response to pandemic right and you know it's not to say that the, we're learning a lot about what's wrong with the government and the bureaucracy and the, the level of you know red tape to cut through to actually uh, do something as simple as order masks and and other you know, protective equipment. Some of the things that we're witnessing now are absolutely bewildering. The fact that there's still a role to be played by private parties in acquiring PPE, you know, protective equipment for you know, for hospitals and 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 first responders. I mean, it's crazy. It's like, wh- why on earth does Elon Musk need to buy uh, ventilators and deliver them to to the state of California? Why why isn't the state of California in a position to buy those Chinese ventilators or or you know individual hospitals? Um, it makes no sense. And yet, and and it's actually it's in this case, it's not for lack of money. It's just there's just a, a lack of agility uh, on the part of of government here, but. So whatever systems we need to put in place for the next pandemic, we really need to figure this out. I mean, this this is as bad as this will be. And I, again, I, I you know I think you and I agree here that we're still at the beginning of this thing. This is still a dress rehearsal for something that could be much much worse. That on some level is guaranteed to eventually happen. You know, whether it's in our lifetime or not. I mean, it's just it's just sheer good luck that. We're facing a a pandemic that has the the lethality of this one, and not one that's that's ten or thirty x this one. Um, so we have to keep an inventory of all of the lessons being learned here, and and do better next time. And and so, I mean, there are several silver linings here. We, we there's a lot we are learning, or at least potentially learning, and you know the, collectively. In response to just the, the need to have institutions that that actually work, um, rather than just populist demagoguery that that uh, appeals to half of a society, um, and the need to have um, you know systems in place and and supply chains and you know not not to be utterly reliant on other countries to produce you know necessary. Um, equipment and medicine, and I mean to have to stockpile things that we know we will eventually need or could need in uh, massive quantities. I mean, we're the to speak of America in particular. I mean, we're like the richest society that's ever existed, and you know we're scrambling to to uh, uh, produce the most basic uh, tools at, at the moment. It makes absolutely no sense. I mean, it's, it's we we should absorb. You know, on some level, the, the the humiliation of this. I mean, you've got doctors in the finest hospitals in the country, you know, covering themselves with bandanas. It's madness, and um, so we we can we can learn these lessons. I mean, the, on some level, these are very simple lessons. And personally, many of us are having our our priorities jiggered around by this, such that you know we're we're connecting with. With deeper values, you know, in this experience, and you know, and experiencing a silver line into it in just, you know, the way in which we're prioritizing our time with our family and just kind of resetting our 
our um, you know career uh, priorities, and I mean, there's, there's a, there are many good things happening for people uh, which are are not going unrecognized. I mean, it's just a question of figuring out how to how to maintain these these epiphanies once life starts back up again. Yeah. Well, Sam, I uh, I love our conversations. It's always nice to hear your voice. And, Likewise. Uh, this, this, we will have many, 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 many conversations over the forthcoming days and weeks and months, no doubt. And uh, I appreciate you, and I appreciate your thinking. So thanks for taking time in your day. Yeah, well, back at you, brother. Keep keep it up. You're, you've been, uh, uh, you know, I think you single handedly got South by Southwest canceled, and it was the right thing to do. Uh, and you were, I mean, we sort of pulled the ripcord together. I mean, maybe you you had pulled it earlier in your life, but like when you and I made the decision, you know, when we were checking back and forth with each other about, uh, you know, what was going to happen with South by Southwest, you know, that was the moment where I was understanding the situation we're in, and and uh, you know, you were. Um, you know, I, uh, you were definitely uh, the first person in my life who was echoing back to me the 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 wisdom of 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 that um, change in outlook. And so, as as you know, thank you for being early on this, and uh, and thank you for all that you're you're doing because you you have been a a great source of information for a very large audience, and uh, we, you just need to keep it up. Thanks so much, Sam. I. Uh... I'll do my best. And uh, it seems so weird to end this way, but I will. <laughs> How can people find you? Where can people find you? What would you like to share before we close up? Um, well, there, there are really only two places where I'm consistently making noise. I used to blog a lot, and, and <laughs> I, I don't do that anymore. I mean, I mean it's, been, it's been years since I... Since I've, I was writing regularly on my blog, but... Um, you do so have an just excellent my... blog post on psychedelic... Or related to psychedelics, though. Right. Also. Yeah, yeah. Um, Oldie but goodie. Dr- yeah, dr- drugs and the meaning of life, which is in audio form on on both of our podcasts. I think it is. Um, but it's, yeah, it's on my blog. But it's, so my podcast is making sense, and the the app where I talk about all things related to meditation and the nature of consciousness, and to some degree psychedelics, um, uh, is waking up, and that's wakingup dot com. Highly recommended. I use it myself. And uh, Sam, to be continued, uh, yeah. thanks again for taking the time. And I'm not sure what we mentioned that might end up in show notes, but if we have show notes, dear listeners, they will be at tim.blog forward slash podcast. You can just search Sam Harris or Harris or Sam, and they will probably pop right up. And thanks for tuning in. Sam, always, uh, always a pleasure. And I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, take care, brother. All right, you too. Take care. Hey, guys, this is Tim again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, this is Five Bullet Friday. Do you want to get a short email from me? Would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend? And Five Bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com all spelled out and just drop in your email and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by FreshBooks. Thousands of listeners and a lot of the contractors I use and my readers use FreshBooks. If you've been thinking about turning your part-time side business into a full-time small business or big business for that matter, you may be feeling some extra uncertainty these days and that's obviously completely natural. There are a lot of questions that can come up. How do you create a professional appearance and experience? Who can help you with support? How do you manage the billing and all of that but still focus on the primary work of your business and on growing your business. FreshBooks is an all-in-one invoicing and accounting solution. It does a lot more than that. That 
helps you take your business from part-time to full-time, and it only takes minutes to set up. They have one of the best sign-up flows in the business. I've seen very few better. They have been helping people turn their passions into small businesses for 15 years, and they can help you too. I've met the founders. I've looked at this product very closely. With automated invoicing, billable time, and expense tracking, and an intuitive dashboard that ties it all together, it's like having a full-time financial assistant with you every step of the way. You can create, customize, and send branded and professional looking invoices in about 30 seconds. You get paid up to twice as fast with fees as low as 1% using ACH payments on FreshBooks. It's a fast, easy, and secure way for clients to pay you for your work and pay you more quickly. One of the many things that sets FreshBooks apart is their award-winning Toronto-based customer service. A real person picks up fast and will help you until you are completely satisfied and have your questions answered. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now, but your ability to build a business that you're passionate about, that you're proud of, doesn't have to be one of those things. Business owners all over the world rate FreshBooks as the easiest accounting software to use. Try it out. Check it out for free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash Tim. Just enter Tim Ferriss in the how did you hear about us section. Again, that's freshbooks.com slash Tim to check it out and try it for free for 30 days. One more time, freshbooks.com slash Tim.